Okay. Okay. <laughs> Greetings. I'm Mika Daniel, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Green Party of Alameda County, it's Green Sunday, held monthly on the second Sunday of the month. We have an exciting program this evening. So without further ado, please welcome Phoebe Thomas Sorgan, County Councilor, Alameda County, who will introduce our first presenter. Phoebe. Thank you, Mika. First, a little about logistics. We flipped a coin to decide which speaker goes first. And we had decided to give the first speaker three minutes to respond after the second speaker. And the second speaker will get initially three minutes extra, and then we'll have Q&A. Dr. Jill Stein will go first. She is a graduate of Harvard University and Harvard Medical School and was a practicing physician for 25 years. She served on the Greater Boston Board of Physicians for Social Responsibility. She worked with Clean Water Action, Toxic Action Center, Global Climate Convergence, and Physicians for a National Health Program. She served as an elected member of Lexington Town Meeting and ran for Massachusetts governor in 2002 and 2010. She ran for Massachusetts House of Representatives in 2004 and for Massachusetts Secretary of State in 2006. In 2012 and 2016, of course, she was the Green Party's presidential candidate. Welcome, Jill, take it away. Thank you so much, Phoebe. Thank you to the Green Party of Alameda County. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody out there for being a part of this very important discussion. And thank you to Howie for being a part of this as well. So I'm just gonna jump right in with some general comments about Ukraine and war and peace. And then I'm going to answer um, in an abbreviated way, the uh, specific questions that we were asked to address. Um, so um, a big thank you to everybody uh, for being here to discuss this proxy war between, um, well, this US pro Russia proxy war in Ukraine. We are all paying a huge price for the war and for the broader war machine that it's a part of because it's not just a war over there as Congressman Adam Schiff and other war hawks would have us believe. It's over there, we don't have to worry about it. But in fact, this war and the reckless expanding war machine that it's a part of are hurting us right here as it impoverishes and endangers us all. In particular, the risks of nuclear war are an emergency of the highest order. The doomsday clock of the Bolton of atomic scientists is at the closest it's ever been, 90 seconds to midnight in the 75 years since the clock was created. Just the nukes on one Trident submarine alone carry more destructive power than all of the bombs in World War II combined. That's just one nuclear submarine. Yet the nuclear treaties that have provided some minimal level of critical deterrence, the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the intermediate nuclear forces, and the open skies, they were ended by the US withdrawal leading to the recent Russian suspension of the last remaining treaty, the New START. So these two superpowers now have about 12,000 nuclear warheads combined, yet merely 100 Hiroshima level bombs. And those are very small compared to the size of nuclear bombs today, which are about a thousand times the size of Hiroshima bombs. Not all of them, but they go that big. If you take just 100 of the smaller Hiroshima sized, which are generally referred to as tactical nuclear weapons, that alone, 100 small bombs, would be enough uh, power to kick up the debris that goes into the upper atmosphere so it doesn't get washed down with weather. It blocks the sun. It reduces food production. 
whether on land or in the oceans, um, fish and so on, all food production gets reduced. And just with 100 of these small tactical nuclear weapons, about a quarter of a billion people would be wiped out just from this minimal use of tactical nuclear weapons. And with modern bombs being 1,000 times as large up to that size, and the targeting of major cities by several of these bigger bombs at a time, essentially a nuclear attack on one major city would of course kill millions of people right then and there. But from the nuclear winter that would result and would last probably for decades, over 2 billion people, that is about a quarter of the Earth's population, would die from a nuclear attack on just one city. And the important thing to remember is that this is not over there. This is everywhere. So the outbreak of a nuclear war anywhere and the exchange of nuclear weapons really threatens us all. And you know, yet we have leaders on both sides who are threatening to use them. Uh, and consider them just a part of their, you know, their options for fighting war. So it's really clear we have to stop this continued escalation towards the use of nuclear weapons. And we can only do that really, truly, in a, in a sure way by uh, engaging a ceasefire now. So that's just one side, that's the endangerment side that we all share. And then there's the other side, which is how the military war machine, et cetera, is devouring uh, resources that we urgently need here at home. So while over a trillion of our tax dollars are being swept up in this torrent of spending for war and militarism, urgent needs are being desperately neglected. And I think we're all familiar with these, like 140 million Americans who struggle at or below the poverty level, 60% living paycheck to paycheck, 70,000 people dying every year from the lack of health insurance, half a million going homeless every night, 43 million uh, people who are locked in student debt, 22 million children, locked in poverty and so on. You know, we have urgent dire needs that are not being funded because the war machine is making out like bandits, including 115 approximately billion dollars being spent on war and support for the war uh, in Ukraine. So we are all in the target hairs, um, uh, in the crosshairs of militarism. And we need to view the war like it is a threat to our own welfare and survival. So in the interests of resolving this existential crisis, we need to be clear about the complexities and the context of the war, because oversimplifying it into a good guy and a bad guy is not gonna solve the problem. We really have to try to understand the problem and it is indeed uh, complex and there's a whole context here. So I wanna start by first just mentioning these three forbidden truths that you won't hear about in the public discussion, you won't hear about in mainstream media, but it's very under, important for understanding the context of this conflict. So first, as Martin Luther King said famously about 60 years ago, the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence today. And the dimensions of that violence are absolutely off the charts from 800 foreign bases, while Russia has about two dozen or so. Uh, anti-terror operations led by the U.S. in an astounding 85 countries uh, around the world that are actually ongoing now, an $840 billion military budget equal to the next nine militaries all combined, and just our expenses to support the Ukraine war effort, this $115 billion, is double the entire annual budget of the Russian military just for that, uh, for the Ukraine piece um, <clears throat> of our expenses are twice the entire Russian military budget. And importantly, we have conducted 250 military interventions 
in the past three decades, over 68 regime change operations since the Second World War, and 6 million people have been killed and 38 million displaced in just the US-led war on terror alone. So the point here is that we have a habit of making war, and the, uh, the prevailing conversations about those war, about those wars, including some of the biggest efforts that we've ever made, like in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Vietnam, the rationale for these uh, wars that gets everybody swept up in them, they are, you know, they are a pack of lies. And the lies eventually come out, but it may take years for the lies to emerge. One must be very skeptical of the rationales provided by the uh, usual suspects, the Department of Defense, the State Department, et cetera, the deep state for the reasons for the war. So it's really important to be very skeptical about the overall rationales as well as the details of what we hear about because the stories are always more complex and almost uniformly, we have been on the wrong side. So it's really important not to take the, um, you know, the glowing descriptions of the great work that we're doing in Ukraine and the wonderful reasons for this war, it's important not to take them at face value and to really scrutinize um, the full context and to seek out information aside from what we're being spoon fed by MSNBC and the likes. So the second thing with the first point being the, um, uh, the greatest purveyor of violence, then the second basic truth is that, um, uh, U.S. militarism uh, and its aims are stated in the official policy known as full spectrum dominance, which can only be described as blatant militarism. And this is effectively an implicit declaration of war against all economic and military competitors, whether friend or foe. And this was first published in the New York Times from the uh, Pentagon documents back in 1992, just after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And uh, it, it calls for deterring potential competitors from even aspiring to a larger regional or global role. And clearly, you know, Russia has a large regional role by virtue of its size, its resources, its economy, its, uh, its fossil fuels, uh, its grains, its farming, et cetera. Russia is one of those regional uh, powers that we have basically been on a mission to constrain, to um, uh, reduce, to push back, to isolate, and to regime change. And there has been, if you look back over our history, we have basically been uh, conducting a cumulative uh, regime change or destruction operation, however you care to view it. Uh, but this has been on ongoing and it's really important to look not just at what happened after you know February uh, 22nd uh, in 2022 but really the whole sweep particularly since 2014 but even before that since the end of the Second World War where there's really been this cumulative set of provocations that have really backed Russia into a corner where it really had um, no shall we say, practical options. Still, what Russia did was illegal and murderous. There's no doubt about that. This is an illegal and murderous war, but it needs to be put in context of the uh, murderous and illegal game plan that includes Russia and the um, containment minimizing of Russia, really the destruction of Russia, which is just a part of the US imperial game plan. So we need to fix both of these. It's not just enough to say bad Russia, get out of Ukraine. We also have to fix uh, what Russia has been provoked into counterattacking uh, on account of. Um, third point here um, is that the US empire has been provoking um, these various degrees of conflict uh, for decades, anything that would interfere with US hegemony. Um, and I think we've basically touched on that. Uh, so another way to view this is that while Ru Russia's invasion onto its head, but in this case, it wasn't a gun, it is nuclear compatible 
missile launchers on its border. Yes, they're not nuclear missiles yet, but they are readily switched out. Once you have those uh, missile launchers in place, which they are there, they are there in Poland, they are there in Romania, and you know Russia's fear uh, is, and very reasonable fears that they will be there in Poland as well, in um, Ukraine as well. Um, so that is basically tantamount to a gun to its head. It's important to remember that when the situation was reversed and when Russian missiles were brought to Cuba, we completely freaked out. And the U.S. was in the process of launching nuclear war when, fortunately, the leaders of Russia and the U.S. had the good sense to sit down and negotiate. Uh, which they did. And I think it was 19 days uh, at, you know, kind of this, uh, on this, uh, sitting on the razor's edge of nuclear war. But let's be clear that, that Russia's freak out to having missiles on its border and basically nuclear attacks that are being rehearsed on its border and uh, troop exercises uh, and all the rest, you know, that uh, is extremely alarming and provocative in the same way that we were provoked, ready to commence nuclear Russia not agreed to sit down and negotiate. And I don't know about you, but I have seen a lot of uh, bids and efforts towards negotiation that Russia has participated in and uh, has been a part of, but which have been stymied and obstructed by the U.S. and West. And we'll come to some of that specific evidence um, a little bit later. So I want to run through now quickly some of the provocations that have accumulated over the decades. Provocations by the U.S. and NATO, and they include this doctrine of full spectrum dominance, which is essentially a threat. It is a challenge that uh, we will crush you uh, just for existing. Um, the uh, U.S. interference in the 1996 re-election campaign of Boris Yeltsin, who was looking like he was going to lose, and a lot of uh, resources and supports kicked in from the U.S., including a public relations team, which took up uh, residence in a hotel in Moscow. You know, we were freaked out about $100 million worth of uh, memes uh, Twitter memes from the Internet Research Agency, um, $100 million, but most of that was not for uh, anything relevant to the election. Actually, that was its entire budget, and what it produced were like uh, Yosemite Sam um, uh, memes and Jesus memes, and much of its production didn't actually uh, uh, occur until after the election itself, we were totally freaked out, you know, total national hysteria about that. Yet, you know, turn the tide a little bit. Uh, it was US money, uh, advisors, pollsters, public relations agents, everything all set up in Moscow to flip the polling results in which um, Yeltsin had been losing to basically put him in a winning position. Uh, it also included an $11 billion IMF loan and a few other little perks that were used to basically rig that election. So, you know, it would be hard to say that the U.S. did not interfere in, in the Russian election. So in the same way that we got very pissed off at even the appearance or the, um, the hype uh, of Russian interference uh, through social media in our election, um, Russia has uh, reason to feel uh, provoked by U.S. interference, which was, um, you know, enormous uh, by com by comparison to what Russia later did to us, supposedly. A um, uh, couple points I'm going to skim through here because I'm sure the clock is ticking. Oh, I, I wanted to just briefly touch on uh, Russia's paranoia about its borders. First, it's not paranoia. We help we all, all countries, you know, do not like their um, their adversaries on their borders, especially with armaments and so on. Um, uh, but in the case of Russia, Russia was actually invaded 
during the Second World War and, you know, uh, going back to the time of Napoleon and before that, Russia has been invaded all over and in World War I uh, and often by the Germans. So when Germany was reunited and the East Germany was admitted uh, into NATO, we promised the USSR, all the Western countries promised the USSR that uh, NATO would not move one step to the East because Russia had been invaded many times and lost 27 million people in the Second World War. We lost somewhere around 500,000, okay? So they've, they, their losses were huge, were absolutely ginormous. So they are touchy about their borders. So it, it makes logical sense uh, in many ways to respect um, that concern that Russia has about its borders. Um, other provocations. Um, I won't go through them all here, but I do want to mention, you know, the uh, the 2014 uh, uh, U.S. supported right wing coup, and uh, it's important to note uh, Secretary Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland had disclosed publicly that the US had spent $5 billion in the run-up uh, in the preceding two to three decades since the fall of the Soviet Union. We had big, big spending in Ukraine supposedly to promote democracy. Well, I think, you know, there's promoting democracy and there's promoting democracy. And so the questions are, you know, what actually was going on in the run-up? Uh, to that coup. And then at the time of the coup itself, there is ample evidence of U.S. micromanagement, actually, of the political outcomes of the coup, as well as the buddy-buddy relationship with the uh, extreme right-wing forces that were uh, responsible for the violence uh, in the Maidan as part of the 2014 coup. And we could go into some of that evidence later if there is time. Uh, but in particular, the conversation of um, Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Piat, the U.S. ambassador, is extremely incriminating. It's not about advising um, Yanukovych. Yanukovych is an afterthought in this conversation. He, his name doesn't even get mentioned until nearly the end. That conversation is very much about manipulating the political outcomes, uh, deciding who the um, uh, the president or the prime minister would be after the coup, removing one of the uh, major actors and organizers from the threesome that uh, Victoria Newland is managing, how they micromanage them, how they bring Biden in to quote, midwife the transition and how they also arrange to bring in the UN to quote, glue the thing together. So this is being micromanaged uh, in great detail uh, in terms of the outcome, the political outcome. So one should not underestimate the heavy hand of uh, US empire in the political um, developments in Ukraine over the last uh, decade in particular, but there's evidence suggesting that we've been active in the developments in Ukraine, uh, going back actually to the end of the Second World War. This is not widely known evidence, but it's actually published by none other than the National Archives of the United States, publishing information gained from the, uh, uh, the follow-up on uh, Nazi war criminals and materials that were turned over to the archives from uh, the US Armed Forces, which is just jaw-dropping, I must we're say. We're close to time, Jill, if you want to wrap thank up. You, thank first. you, thank you, thank you. All right, so let me, um, uh, I, I won't go into detail, but I do want to acknowledge that um, there have been many uh, peace accords which uh, Russia has been willing to go along with um, and that which the U.S. has obstructed this is a real problem, the US and the West. And this includes disclosures even by Zelensky himself uh, in just the last couple of days about how the US and, um, uh, and the West were obstructing uh, the Minsk Accords. Uh, and then there were also peace deals 
um, that were being arranged by Turkey right after the war broke out, and also by the former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. And they have also um, uh, basically uh, disclosed that their efforts were shot down, not by Russia, but by the United States. Um, so quickly, what have I not addressed here? Um, a progressive position on Ukraine, I'll just summarize to say it is not a militaristic approach. Um, uh, conflict is not solved through militarism, especially a conflict between two uh, nuclear superpowers. And if one thinks that you can tiptoe your way around that, I think one is not appreciating the actual um, emergency of the uh, existential nuclear threat that we are all in the shadow of right now. Uh, what factors are needed to bring about peace? You know, ending NATO, uh, or at least stopping expansion, restoring Ukraine's neutrality, removing uh, US NATO uh, missiles from Ukraine, also removing uh, Russian troops from Ukraine. That, of course, is part of the deal. Um, uh, Preserving Russian uh, status in Crimea, I think, is going to be essential. There's no way that Russia is going to give up its port based on history, based on uh, the referendum and independent polling uh, in Crimea. Crimea uh, is going to remain Russia. There, uh, Russian. There's no way that is going to be um, averted. Um, nuclear weapons treaties need to be restored. Uh, U.S. and allies need to stop obstructing diplomacy and dialogue? Should the US continue sending military aid and other support? Uh, we should not prolong a deadly war with deadly consequences, especially for Ukraine, a war that we provoked to start with. We need to stop prolonging it. We need to stop sending weapons and military aid and instead provide humanitarian relief and aid for reconstruction. Um, parts of Ukraine, uh, currently occupied by Russian forces. Um, Russian forces as a whole um, should be removed, but that needs to be part of a larger deal. Um, and uh, finally, on NATO, NATO uh, needs to be disbanded just as the Warsaw Pact was disbanded. And I'm sure I have used up my time, so I'm gonna stop there and thank you for your kind attention. And I look forward to Howie's remarks. Thank you, Jill. So uh, Howie Hawkins is our next speaker. Howie's been a Green Party candidate for city council, mayor and auditor in Syracuse, New York, winning 48% for a district council seat in 2011 and 35% of the citywide vote for a city auditor in 2015. Prior to becoming the Green Party's presidential candidate in 2020, he was the Greens governor candidate in New York in 2010, 2014, and 2018. Howie is a founding member of the Ukraine Solidarity Network and a former founder of the Green Party. And his articles on politics, economics, and environmental issues have appeared in Against the Current, Black Agenda Report, Counterpunch, Labor Notes, New Politics, Society and Nature, Z Magazine, and other publications. Please welcome Howie Hawkins. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, everybody, for being here, and thanks to the Alameda County Green Party for having this forum. Let's start with what's going on in Ukraine. There's a war going on. It was started by Russia. U.S.-led Western imperialism is no excuse for Russia to try to recolonize Ukraine. That's where a progressive position has to start from. We should be opposed to Russia's war of aggression and support Ukraine's right to self-determination. The anti-imperialist position is to support the national liberation struggle of the Ukrainian people against Russian imperialism. That means we should demand Rus Russian troops out now. Like we said, US troops out now from Vietnam. There was nothing to negotiate. We were wrong in Vietnam, Russia's wrong in Ukraine. It also means we should support the Ukrainians with economic, humanitarian, and yes, military aid. 
for their national liberation struggle. And let's think about how uh, genocidal this war of Russia and Ukraine is. Russian leaders, and this is like almost unique in history, have stated their genocidal intentions out loud. Putin's speeches and statements for years, and particularly the last two years, have denied that Ukraine is a state and that Ukrainians are a nationality. Other leaders like Dmitry Medvedev and state media personalities like Vladimir Solovyov denigrate Ukrainians in the most dehumanizing hate speech, calling them subhuman, mentally defective, drug addicts, Nazis, worms, parasites, thieves. And some have said on state media and some leaders in their social media that the solution to the Ukrainian question is to kill all the Ukrainians that won't accept russification. And these war crimes that have been going on have been massively documented in detail in reports by the UN's Independent Commission on Inquiry on Ukraine, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and many news organizations from Al Jazeera to the New York Times to the AP Frontline Collaboration on War Crimes Watch Ukraine. And what are these crimes? Well, first of all, it's an illegal war of aggression and annexation in blatant violation of the UN Charter in Russia's signing with Ukraine and other countries, the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, the 1997 Russia-Ukraine Friendship Treaty, and the Minsk Protocols. It involves targeted bombing of civilian homes, over 2,000 schools, over 500 hospitals, clinics, and pharmacies, and targeting energy, water, and sewage infrastructure. These are war crimes and massive human rights abuses in the Russian occupied territories, mass interrogation and surveillance through these filtration camps and processes, arbitrary detention, summary executions, torture, rapes, castrations, and then the forced deportation of people to Russia, including the abduction of thousands of children. It's an article in the New York Times today about some of these children. Mass looting of property, from washing machines to whole factories to the contents of museums. In the occupied territory, smashing trade unions, civic organizations, independent media. And then there's the legal, cultural, and language Russification of Ukrainians who are still living in the Russian occupied territories, which is genocide under the Genocide Convention, cultural genocide. So, of course, the progressive position is to condemn the Russian invasion, demand that the Russian troops withdraw and go home, and support Ukraine's fight for survival and independence. As I said, US led Western imperialism is no excuse or justification for this genocidal war. Inter imperialist competition between capitalist states inevitably injects itself in any national liberation struggle because we live in a world of global capitalism. So of course, we should fight Western as well as Russian imperialism in Ukraine and around the world. We should give our political support to the progressive social movements in Ukraine who are fighting on two fronts. They're fighting the Russian invasion, but they're also fighting against the neoliberal austerity, privatization, and deregulation policies of the Ukrainian government, which they're doing with the encouragement of predatory, predatory Western imperialists. Now, where I'm taking my lead is from the progressive movements in Ukraine with whom I've been communicating for the last two years. And the progressive position should be to support these movements, the trade unions, the Green Party and the environmentalists, the socialists and the anarchists, the feminists, the LGBTQ organizations, and the ethnic minority groups of the Roma and the Tatars and the African and Asian Ukrainians. I've been on dozens of calls with these people. And I'll tell you one thing, they are unanimous. They want arms to defend themselves. And they also want our support in opposing the Ukrainian government's neoliberal domestic policies. So they want our support in, in resisting Western imperialism, particularly in calling for the cancellation of Ukraine's debts to the IMF and Western banks. So we can, we can both fight Russian imperialism and Western imperialism. 
And I have to tell you, these progressives in Ukraine are pretty disappointed and disgusted with those parts of the Western left and peace movement that oppose arms for their self-defense, that disregard them, don't talk to them, lecture at them about what's good for them. They call it us planning or west planning and call it the same old Yankee imperialist mentality that disregards what the people fighting colonial oppression want. As the Ukrainian uh, manifesto by Ukrainian feminists called Right to Resist, which was written in response to some Western feminists who issued a statement opposing arms to Ukraine. They said, if Ukrainian society lays down its arms, there will be no Ukrainian society. If Russia lays down its arms, the war will end. And the war started in 2014. There was protests to what happened with the Maidan revolution and people within their rights to protest and speak up. But it wasn't right to militarize, it, which was done by uh, Russian operatives. We've, hear it, we've heard it from them. Igor Girkin, who is a former FSB, FSB officer and colonel in the GRU Military Intelligence Service. He said in interviews in late 2014 and early 2015 that it was his military unit that forced the Crimean legislature to go into session and vote for a snap independence referendum at gunpoint. That was in March 2014. In April, he was in the Donbass and led the takeover of government buildings, the removal of elected officials, and the installation of their own puppets. And he said in that interview, there would have been no armed rebellion. The people didn't want to overthrow the government without the actions of his military units. And the forces that undertook these coups under the direction of secret services of, of Russia included criminal syndicates associated with various oligarchs, the ultra-nationalist Russian imperial movement, the neo-Nazi Rusich group, which is a militia within the Wagner mercenary group, um, and what came out was military dictatorships, the trade unions, the independent media, the civic organizations were smashed, and people who oppose Russian rule, Ukrainians, are brutally repressed. Those were the real coups in 2014. What happened in Kyiv was a popular political revolution against corruption, oligarchic rule, police brutality, and political repression. Millions participated in Kyiv and across Ukraine. And when Yanukovych abandoned his presidency and fled to Russia, the parliament voted unanimously to replace him with a temporary replacement and call for elections in 10 weeks. That was not a coup. That was a popular revolution. And I've talked to a number of Ukrainians who are active in the Maidan Square rev occupation and demonstrations, including the fiance of the Party of Green's elected leader, Tatiana Bodum, and he was active from the first student protests, uh, which weren't that big until the, uh, Yanukovych's uh, goons came in and beat the crap out of them while they were sleeping. They were actually planning to leave Maidan Square that night. That was November 30th, and the demonstrations exploded. And these activists will tell you they were not freezing their asses off in the winter waiting for cookies from Victoria Nuland. Most of them didn't know who the hell she was. They were there to demand the end of corruption, repression, and oligarchic rule that they saw embodied in Yanukovych's administration. And they just scoff at the idea that they were just pawns in some US-backed coup. And they considered people who fall for that to not know anything about Russia, I mean, Ukraine, and just be falling for crude Russian propaganda. So the Greens should at least support the minimum position that has broad support in the peace movement and the left. And that's to affirm Ukraine's right to self-determination, condemn Russia's war of aggression, demand US troops out now, and demand US diplomacy with Russia to negotiate not the Ukraine solution, that's up to the Ukrainians, but mutual security arrangements and nuclear disarmament. That's how we deal with this nuclear threat. And it should be strong public diplomacy, um, and I think if we can get those mutual security agreements and move toward nuclear disarmament, um, Putin would have a politically acceptable way to withdraw. Um, but the US, we should be demanding that that's what they really be pushing 
for it too. And I agree with Jill. I mean, we got to reopen those treaties the U.S. unilaterally pulled out of, as well as the uh, Conventional Armed Forces Treaty that Russia unilaterally pulled out of, and now they're not participating in START. So um, that's the kind of diplomacy we should demand to, to cool off the bigger geopolitical picture. But of course, I would like the Greens to go further than just condemning the invasion and demanding Russian troops out. And that is actively supporting what the progressive movements in Ukraine ask of us in solidarity. And that's supporting the sanctions against Russia's war making capacity and its imperialist leaders, supporting arms to Ukraine so they can defend themselves, supporting economic aid to Ukraine so they can provide housing, health, education, and other public services, working to do material aid projects for Ukrainian trade unions and social movements who are doing massive work on humanitarian aid projects and mutual aid projects in the country now, and support and demand the cancellation of Ukrainian debts to the IMF and Western banks. Just because the place where the Ukrainians can get arms is the US-led Western imperialist bloc, doesn't mean the left should subordinate the Ukrainians to democratic demand for national liberation so we can just oppose Western imperialism. And some people say we should support a Russian victory because it will supposedly weaken Western imperialism. I think we should reject those kinds of positions. What we should be doing is supporting Ukraine's national liberation against both Russia's primarily military imperialism and the West's primarily economic imperialism. That's a consistent anti-imperialist position. And we can do both. We can oppose both imperialisms. We don't have to choose. And in terms of opposing U.S. militarism and imperialism, you know, it's, I think we all understand the U.S. is not very credible when it says it opposes Russian occupied territory in Ukraine while it's supporting Israeli occupied Palestinian territory with U.S. military aid to Israel. So if we're going to cut off arms to anybody, let's start with Israel with all the craziness going on there now. The bloated military budget in the overseas military bases empire the U.S. has needs to be deeply cut. A green foreign policy that we should advocate should state that the U.S. has been wrong for its many aggressive wars and coups and manipulations of elections. We should proclaim a new policy based on peace, democracy, and sustainable development. Of course, central to that would be a green foreign policy that embraces an eco-socialist global Green New Deal to make reparations for imperialist wars and exploitation. And it could be financed in major part by deep cuts in the military budget. And I think also part of that should be disarmament initiatives. If we're going to go to Russia and say, let's have mutual security agreements and nuclear disarmament, we could sweeten the deal or get the process started by declaring no first use scrapping the ICBMs like Daniel Ellsberg suggests, because they're just targets. We don't need them for a deterrent. And then reducing our total nuclear arms to a minimum credible deterrent. And with those initiatives, go to Russia and the other nuclear powers and say, we want us all to get into this new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. We can be demanding those things and at the, still time, at the same time, support the Ukrainian struggle for national liberation. So I got a lot more notes than I got time to give, so I'm gonna jump. Um, I would just say, um, in concluding this part, you know, the Greens, we're divided on a question of arms to Ukraine, as is the international left, the left around the US, the peace movements. Um, but I think we have to, agree to disagree on something so we can continue to work together for the rest of our program where we have a high degree of uh, agreement. From the Green New Deal and Medicare to all to a pro-peace and democracy foreign policy. So, you know, this conversation is gonna continue and I don't think we should demonize each other because we have different positions. Um, I've answered the question you, you gave us of should the US continue to send military aid and other support to Ukraine? Of course it should. Uh, if you say you support Ukraine's right to self-determination, 
but oppose sending them arms so they can defend themselves, I don't think you're really supporting their self-determination. And there's no reason to believe that arms, if arms were cut off to Ukraine, that Russia would say, okay, we stop. They're the ones that started this war. They're the ones continuing the war. So I'm saying we should give our military support to the Ukrainian government because the armed forces are you know, organized by the state. But we should give our political support to the progressive movements in Ukraine and not the neoliberal Ukrainian government. Um, and Ukrainian progressives emphasize that what they are engaged in is a people's war on the Ukrainian side, a people's war of mass participation and self-organization in both the military and the civil resistance to the Russian invasion. So you have massive volunteering for the Ukrainian armed forces, but also massive self-organization to organize humanitarian assistance and mutual aid that the state cannot or does not provide. So question, what should be done about NATO? I think we should you know, engage in these negotiations I'm talking about, about mutual security agreements that include Russia or transatlantic and European uh, that would satisfy Russia's security concerns as well as uh, the Baltic states and Poland and everybody. Um, if we can agree to those, then Putin has a politically acceptable way to withdraw. Um, and I would also say that, you know, the reality now is that, you know, Ukraine, I mean, NATO is just not going to dissolve unilaterally, even if the U.S. withdrew, you know, the Baltic states and Poland, and those on the border of Russia, seeing what happened in Ukraine, they're going to want to maintain some other countries, you know, to support them. What we need to pursue is what Gorbachev proposed uh, back after the nuclear arms agreements with, with Reagan, and that is a common European home. Unfortunately, and we should criticize this, Clinton and Bush administrations rejected that and pushed out NATO and then extended it beyond Europe with interventions, you know, like in Libya and Yugoslavia. Uh, now, Putin gave NATO's eastward expansion as one of the reasons for going to war, although you hear that more in what we hear from him in this country than you hear domestically in Russia. Uh, because there it's a lot more of this racist, great Russian chauvinism that's being put out by their media. Um, but we should urge the U.S. to take Putin up on his challenge and say, you want uh, you know, us to deal with your geopolitical security concerns? Okay, we're ready to deal. And let's negotiate these mutual security agreements and move that toward nuclear disarmament. The question, what factors will bring about peace? I'll give you quickly four factors. This US diplomacy with Russia for mutual security and disarmament would be a major factor. A second factor is gonna be Ukraine's successful resistance to Russia's invasion. That can convince Putin that he can't win the war. A third factor is the Russian anti-war movement. There are thousands of war opponents in jail. Over a million Russians have fled the country, which is a brain drain and an economic sanction in itself. Um, and the fourth factor is the world peace movement. And this is like the anti-Vietnam War movement. You know, the reason the war stopped, three things. The Vietnamese resisted, the GIs resisted, that's the equivalent of the Russian anti-war movement. And I was a part of that movement. Nixon couldn't carry out the war because, you know, the troops after Tet were saying, you know, we don't want to fight. And sometimes they turn the guns on their officers. And then the third factor there was the world peace movement. It was, you know, hurting U.S. standing in the world. And I think those are the factors combined are what are going to get us to peace. What should be done about the parts of Ukraine currently in the occupied or currently occupied by Russian forces? Um, you know, that was on the table in March. And that was uh, the Ukraine government and Russia's said, okay, we'll go back to the uh, borders at the start of the invasion on April, February 23rd or whenever it was. Um, Ukraine would be neutral, non-nuclear, non-NATO, and there would be a treaty signed by the major powers that guaranteed Ukraine's sovereignty. And then 
the status of the Donbass and Crimea would be dealt with diplomatically, probably by an internationally supervised referendum with everybody who lived there and wanted to go back being able to vote. And I disagree that it was the US that stopped that. That was at the end of March. On April 7th, Lavrov uh, said, uh, I got it here somewhere in my notes, but he rejected it then. Boris Johnson got there on April 9th. And whatever he said to the Zelensky, and it's only one source, and he's since said he just advised Zelensky don't trust Putin. Uh, Zelensky made his own decision. It was still open to negotiations. Um, and then Putin, a few days later, said uh, the peace agreements are at a dead end. Now, this is when Russia was at the peak of its occupation of Ukraine. So, um, you know, that's one thing I disagree with Jill on. How are you? About two minutes left. Um, okay. Um, so, you know, we got to respect what the Ukrainians want. And the latest poll, and this has been consistent all year, this is from late February, 87% of Ukrainians oppose a land for peace, peace deal with Russia. They've seen what's happened to their families and friends and compatriots in the Russian occupied territories. They've seen what happened in Bucha and what happened in Kherson and Kharkiv. And they say, we don't want to leave our people to the Russian occupation. Um, so I think, you know, in the end, that may be what happens, but it's up to the Ukrainians uh, to make those decisions. So, you know, to sum up this part, and then I'll make a few responses to Jill, uh, you know, peace will come when Russia stops its aggression. So we should be demanding the Russian troops out and supporting Ukrainians right to national self-determination, supporting their resistance. Um, so I mentioned the negotiations. Uh, Jill raised the specter of nuclear war and the doomsday clock from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. You should read their statement. They said they moved the clock closer to midnight because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's most of what the opening statement is all about. Um, Minsk um, and, and Naftali Bennett and these others. Naftali Bennett uh, was asked a question uh, about, and the way the question was phrased, or the way the translation came out is that it made it sound like he said the US blocked. Um, and what he was saying was stopped. And he was talking about the whole process, which he clarified afterwards. Both sides didn't implement Minsk. I mean, the Russians, after the first Minsk, there was supposed to be elections internationally supervised under Ukrainian law. And the so-called People's Republics held their own elections two months later without any international observers. And then after Minsk II, uh, the contact line was supposed to be frozen. And uh, the People's Republics went on the offensive and took a town and changed the line. Uh, the week after it was signed, um, there was supposed to be uh, Ukrainians taking control of the border with Russia and the heavy weapons from Russia being returned. That didn't happen. And then Ukraine said, well, we're then not going to give the special autonomous status to the Donbass Oblast. Um, and they had 82 negotiations. What finally killed it is when Putin recognized the so-called People's Republics as independent states two days before the invasion. Um, and then on Crimea, and I'm getting close to my time, which I'm over my time. Okay, last point. Um, I would just note that Fu Kong, the Chinese ambassador to the EU said last week that China does not recognize Crimea as Russian territory. And I don't know what role the Chinese are gonna play in all this because they're getting very cheap oil, which is beneficial to them as long as this war goes on. But uh, it's interesting that there's peace plan, which is really a statement of principles. The first thing it says is to respect territorial integrity um, of all nations, which would imply Russia should get out of Ukraine. So a lot to talk about, thanks. Okay, so we're going to begin the Q&A shortly, but first, uh, Jill Stein has three minutes to offer a brief response to anything that uh, she just heard, and um, I'll turn it over to you, Jill, assuming that you wish to do so. 
Great. All right. Thanks. And I will try to talk fast because there's a lot to say. Same time, I don't want to get totally into the weeds here because, you know, I think one of the basic uh, premises of being green is that we believe in nonviolence and we believe in nonviolent conflict resolution and we believe in dialogue and negotiations. And, you know, it, whatever you say, it's very clear that the US and the West have been obstructing. If I can share my screen here briefly, let's see. Do I have screen share now? Yeah, okay. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is just one. Zelensky admits that he sabotaged the Minsk peace deal with Russia and the West Bloc negotiations. Now, Russia may have thrown in the towel at some point. All right, where's this from? This is from um, uh, the Geopolitical Economy Report, and it is based on uh, his interview, Zelensky's interview with Der Spiegel. So like not covered in the United States at all. So, um, you know, I just want to um, uh, contest how he's, um, saying, oh, but, you know, Russia, 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 Russia. I would be very skeptical about buying the reports that you're hearing straight out of um, the Western media because we've been through WMDs before. We've been through the incubator babies uh, in the Gulf War. We've been through the uh, Viagra mass rapes, et cetera. We've been through all these horror stories. It's very important to be skeptical about them, including the reports that it's our adversary's responsibility for blocking peace accords when it is reported by the players themselves, uh, including Zelensky, including Hollande of France, including Merkel of Germany, that the US has been obstructing uh, peace deal and negotiations. So, you know, I agree the problem here is not just, um, you know, it's not all on Ukraine, it's also on Russia. We don't have a good guy and a bad guy. We have a very confused fog of war. We have people who've been um, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, really, harmed and destroyed and violated on both sides and horrible deaths and all the rest. But in the midst of that, we also have an invisible player, which is the US that has not only been ginning up this war, but has also been systematically destroying a peaceful resolution to the war. So I think we do not want to resort to throwing more weapons and uh, fuel on this explosive fire that we are all very much at risk of. And I want to also comment that as Greens, we've really made up our minds. We've been dialoguing about this for you know at least a year. And initially there was a split, but in the most recent vote um, about endorsing the, uh, uh, the March 18th peace demonstration in uh, Washington, which uh, specifically called for no funding, uh, no weapons for the war, fund human needs instead, not war. It was specifically a denial of funding uh, Ukraine's uh, defense and military. And the vote on that was 88 in support of that demonstration and the, that agenda seven against. So it's not like Greens are divided on this. From what I'm seeing and hearing, we have considered the evidence and we are making up our minds in line with the, um, the basic uh, Green Party vision and commitment to peace. It doesn't mean we go back to exactly where we were before and this stalemate. It means we go back with, um, with U.S. Uh, stepping up to the plate, not to dismantle its uh, empire overnight, that would be very nice, but let's at least, um, you know, let's at least be honest players who are seeing the peace process, bad enough that we really pushed uh, Russia into a place where it had very little choice except to fight back. It said it was going to do that, and it did. Um, and bad enough time, that so we have instigated up. this war. We need to very much, um, you know, start 
uh, playing the role of a peacemaker here. And shame on Biden that he's not doing that. And China are in fact stepping up to uh, fill the void. So this is very bad for Ukraine. It's very bad for Russia and the US. And it's very bad in our own self-interest and our position around the world because it's only the West, uh, the elite countries of the West that are our traditional partners who are with us on this. Most of the world is not. And it's very important that we step up to a much more uh, humane uh, position. And that includes supporting Russia's original proposal, which was that uh, we have a common European home uh, and that we expand on the, uh, the EU and the OSCE to build that common European home and that ultimately it should integrate the Green New Deal and a global Green New Deal. And then instead of throwing all this money into destroying ourselves, uh, we, you know, we put that money into the eco-socialist Green New Deal that our survival is also depend on. So there's a win-win here, but we need to step up and be faithful to the green uh, visions and values that we share. Great, thanks so much for that, Jill. All right, we're entering the Q&A portion of our um, forum today, and we have uh, just under half an hour left and a lot of people uh, who might want to ask questions. So how we're going to do it is everyone will get uh, one minute to ask your question, and we're going to take three at a time. And then uh, each of our speakers will have one minute per question. So in other words, three minutes each to uh, respond, uh, assuming they want to address each of the questions. And uh, we'll we'll take hands raised uh, largely in order. And I see people are already uh, lining up here. Um, we will use a progressive stack such that if there are um, a lot of um, same gender or same ethnicity in a row, we will bump some other people up to try to get some, um, uh, make sure that all the voices are heard. Um, but for now, let me just go ahead and take the first three that I see. And that's gonna be John Ryman, uh, Jeff, Perez and Balram. So, um, John, go ahead and un unmute and uh, let's hear your question in one minute or less. Well, I've got a comment. And I think that what we have to understand Jill Stein's comments in context of the uh, fact that the majority of the left has come under uh, the influence of the fascist connected Putin. And Jill Stein is a perfect example. 2016, she went over to Moscow and had a nice sumptuous banquet with Putin and his fascist buddy, Michael Flynn. She gave a speech in Moscow in which she had not one word of criticism of, of Putin. She returned here and she chose as a running mate an overt Assad supporter. She had not one word of criticism or hardly a word of criticism for Trump when she ran. She called Trump the peace candidate. She now calls for the conditions that would lead to the victory of the invasion. There's no way around that. She's silent on Putin's war crimes. She's silent on Putin's many fascist links. John, this 15 seconds. Demonization. I'll just finish with this. This is not demonization. It's just recognizing um, what Stein and the Putinized left, what they uh, stand for, which is the abandonment of our number one responsibility which is international working class solidarity. We can't turn our back and ignore that. Great, thanks, John. Uh, Jeff, you're next. Go ahead and unmute. One minute. Okay, can you hear? You can hear me, right? Great. Go ahead. Great. Um, first, I, foremost, do you believe in consistency? Um, first, you said an aid to Israel, which I agree on military aid, but the Ukraine—that's a hundred billion dollars in additional military aid we don't we need the money here second question i have is do you believe you believe in like hypocrisy that what we have amongst progressives look at our 401ks our our pension funds and everything look where we're investing our money the military industrialized complex you agree to target that divest from the military industrialized complex since our elected officials are not listening and um yeah pretty much that and everything is what they say in the news uh what i don't agree with what how he is his assessment with the ukraine i'm going to be i'm going to finish this up number one the ukraine under this nato proxy war they voted to target union workers anti-union they privatized majority of their industries and now they want to raise their social security age 
This is the backing of our own government and the NATO coup. Can can you answer on that? Thank you. Over now. Thanks so much. Uh, Baram, go ahead and unmute in one minute. Yes, thanks. Uh, I was very surprised uh, the two speakers, uh, Jill and Howie, uh, sounded very much the same. You don't have anyone supporting Russia's point of view. I mean, I like to support Russia's point of view. And I'm so shocked that Howie repeated basically a lot of the NATO propaganda. I mean, Bucha, come on, Bucha was a propaganda set up. It was not real. And so many other things. The real event started from the 2014 coup, which is a NATO coup, okay? And uh, uh, the, after that, for this eight years, Ukraine has killed 14,000 people in Donbass, okay? Nobody mentioned that. This is the reason for Putin to go and defend the Russian population of Eastern Ukraine. And the history is very important. Eastern Ukraine, this east part of the river Dnipro, it was Russia, the west part was Poland. I mean, I gave a talk, crisis in Ukraine 2014 at the Green Party uh, ANM. Okay, you can refer to that. It, the history is very important. Eastern part is Russian. And they said, we do not agree with the coup, 2014 coup, yes, Howie, in uh, Kiev, we don't, uh, support this coup regime, so we want to become Russian. And they had uh, referendums that are internationally supervised, okay? So <laughs> accepted, they want to become Russian. And uh, and so uh, Putin was basically eight years late to- 15 interview. seconds. That's uh, all about it. I can continue later on with the Russian point of view. <laughs> I've been there many times and uh, to Ukraine. Zelensky has banned all leftist parties in Ukraine, okay? I, I went to probably the last leftist conference in Ukraine. <clears throat> Thank you. Great, okay, over to you. Uh, let, I don't mind who starts. Uh, someone can jump in and we can just alternate from there. Uh, okay, I could, I could jump in. Um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna focus on some common themes here. Um, uh, you know, Baram is exactly right, and thank you, Baram, for bringing up that point. Uh, you know, how about the fourteen thousand people dead in um, uh, in the Donbas, um, who were basically murdered by the right wing outcome of the U.S. supported uh, twenty fourteen coup? And I, I agree that what we're hearing from Howie is what you would hear on MSNBC, and I I fear that um, you know. Uh, you really have to look at your news sources carefully to be sure that you're not just under the umbrella of, um, you know, of the uh, uh, Department of Defense talking points because they will uh, suffocate you and they will, you know, colonize your brain. And that is always what happens uh, in the aftermath of a U.S. Uh, regime change war. And it takes years to overcome that. So I would be very skeptical about accepting the war crimes and the points that Bahram made about Bucha is absolutely right. Um, uh, there, you know, there are real, uh, there are there are opposing explanations for these supposed war crimes, and it's very important. Important, I think, to read um, other sources like Consortium News, which has uh, very well informed. Um, uh, international observers who are, you know, provide another interpretation of these kinds of events, including for the supposed uh, war crimes in Bucha, the supposed theft of the Russian children uh, that many people argue were just being um, sheltered. I mean, a lot of people have emigrated from Eastern Ukraine into Russia of their own accord millions actually. So, you know, it's very important not to just take the uh, uh, the US explanations at face value. I wanna underscore what was said, you know, uh, about uh, Ukraine banning parties of the left, also banning uh, labor unions and their autonomy and their ability to function as well as opposing media sources. So when we talk about Ukrainian 
uh, sovereignty that has to be respected. It's important to understand that Ukrainian sovereignty doesn't exist. Uh, Ukrainian sovereignty completely went out the door in the 2014 coup when uh, uh, right-wing forces basically uh, took over Ukraine thanks to uh, U.S. intervention. I'll stop there. Great. Over to you, Howard. Well, my primary sources are activist progressives in Ukraine. And I can't tell you how angry they get when they hear that they have no sovereignty or agency. They're under assault, massive war crimes. MSNBC doesn't agree with cutting aid to Israel or the 75% cut in the military budget that I advocated when I ran for president or unilateral nuclear disarmament initiatives. So uh, that's not where I'm getting my information from. You know, the question of nonviolence, yes, for us, we don't initiate politics with violent means, but we also support people's right to self-defense, I would hope. If people aren't allowed to defend themselves from violent assaults, we're, we're basically complicit in those violent assaults. So there's got to be a way to support people's right to defend themselves. Uh, you know, Eastern Ukraine being Russia, that's a Russian trope. Less than 40% of the people in Donbass, uh, in both those oblasts, Donetsk and Luhansk, were ethnic Russians. And the polling before 2014 showed that the separatist movement was very marginal. And so they had grievances. There was the oligarchs polarized the country around Ukrainian versus Russian nationalism. But the grassroots people, you know, they weren't calling for a, a revolution and, you know, seizing power, these so-called people's republics. Um, and banning leftist parties, yeah, that's bad. They also banned Nazi parties. Um, but those so-called leftist parties, you got to realize the Communist, the Progressive Socialist Party, the Socialist Party, Barapa, these groups are, they're basically Russian nationalists, they're traditionalists, ortho, Orthodox Russian, or the Orthodox Russian Church, you know, values, anti-LGBTQ, patriarchal. Um, they're not the left. There's a new left in Ukraine, and they are feminist, ecological, democratic. Um, the 14,000, it's about half and half on both sides. O OSCE has documented that uh, both sides were responsible for deaths. It wasn't all, you know, uh, the Kiev government attacking the so-called People's Republics. 30 and seconds. Finally, huh? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, plenty of time. Um, it's not hypocritical to say we want to end U.S. imperialism and imperialist wars and spending money on those imperialist policies and also saying, let's support Ukraine's right to defend itself. That's a consistent anti-imperialist position. Okay, the next three up are, we're going to do a little gender stack and it's going to be Janet Cobran, followed by James McFadden, then David Schwartzman. So, um, Janet, go ahead and unmute, and uh, you've got it one minute. Yes, hi. Uh, so aside from the overwhelming evidence that without nuclear arms controls in place, the outbreak of a nuclear war is inevitable and unwinnable, the profitable war machine, the Mickey Mat, or the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Acad Academia Think Tank Complex, as Ray McGovern calls it, requires an enemy to maintain its hegemonic imperialism, thus the ongoing Russophobia campaign the Mickey Mat floods us with, uh, while also eschewing uh, diplomacy over Ukraine. China is next, of course. Uh, I voted for Jill for president in 2016. 15 and, seconds. And for Howie in 2020, but frankly, I regret voting for Howie, not that there was any other choice. That said, can Jill address how we can overcome Russophobia in the US in order to open a path to nuclear arms control negotiations before the entire world is destroyed? 
Thank you. Thank you. James, go ahead. Uh, this is mostly directed to Howie. Um, you know, the U.S. foments color revolutions all the time. And I'm wondering if you ever have really read about how we do this to install neoliberal puppets. And the um, U.S. clearly, I mean, the Newland uh, uh, recording clearly shows it was a coup. And I don't know how you could deny it. And the Maidan massacre, it's now been shown that it was basically hitmen that, that were that were run by neo-Nazis. So, you know, again, but that led to a, uh, to a, basically to a civil war and, uh, and with the Donbass trying to break away. Russia didn't, didn't recognize it at that point. So it was a civil war situation where the NATO went in and started fostering uh, uh, one side in it. And this is much like what happened in Yugoslavia. So my question is also for Howie, have you ever read anything about Yugoslavia? Have you read To Kill a Nation by Michael Parenti or Fool's Crusade by Diana Johnstone, which outlines how these uh, uh, color revolutions are fomented, how we work to do whatever it's gonna do. In that case, we were breaking countries apart. We were saying, oh, we gotta break this country apart. We're gonna foment civil war and we're gonna break <laughs> it up. And this time we're trying to hold it together when it was a civil war where the Donbass was trying to break up. It's complete nonsense for the NATO to be operating in, this, in, these, uh, in these places and doing this kind of, uh, uh, of stuff. Great, thanks, Jay. Uh, next up, uh, David, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, first, I want to say that the the only winners in this war, which U.S. and NATO provoked, and the Russian invasion actually took the bait in their criminal and illegal invasion. So I find myself uh, in between the position of Jill and Howie here. Uh, the only winners is fossil capital, which is driving us to climate catastrophe. The only winners is militarism. We see military budgets going up globally. And, and the uh, empowerment of NATO, with Finland joining NATO and uh, Sweden maybe at the edge. So since China's peace plan was mentioned, and in particular, the provision to respect the UN Charter and sovereignty, shouldn't the anti-war movement and the, and the anti-imperialist movement back that plan and demand a ceasefire and negotiations on that basis. Thank uh, you, David. So I That's find good. myself in between. That's my question. Thank you. Okay, this time we'll start with Howie. Go ahead, you have three minutes. Well, you know, these color revolutions, that's a Russian trope to uh, denigrate popular uprisings in many cases. I mean, you even had coming off of RT, uh, the notion that the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, the George Floyd rebellion was a color revolution. They were putting that out because their boy was Trump. Um, so I think you got to look at each circumstance in its concrete terms. Um, Newland, you know, that uh, Fuck the EU tape has come up a couple times. The context was she and Ambassador Piat were talking about who to recommend to Yanukovych to become the prime minister. It was which of the three leaders on the Maidan. And they rejected the right-wing guy from the uh, Savota party as a problem. They rejected uh, Vitaly Klitschko, the popular boxer, uh, and went with the guy in the middle. Yatsenyenko, and uh, that's who actually Yanukovych offered the prime ministership to. The process was prime minister recommends, parliament approves. Uh, Yatsenyenko said, no thanks, we need new elections. Uh, but that was about trying to help Yanukovych get a coalition with the opposition on the street and chill things out. That was two weeks before Yanukovych fled. Um, so. The idea that that is the smoking gun about how the U.S. staged the coup, I don't think is there. Um, I have read Parenti and Johnston or Stone on uh, Yugoslavia, and 
The details of that are a long discussion, but I do recognize the U.S. played a, a negative role in many respects in, in Yugoslavia, but that's a whole long discussion. Um, and then just going to what David said, the ceasefire and negotiation, um, you know, Russia wants that, except they, they want, in their terms, negotiation means uh, they're not going to negotiate the oblast that they've occupied or even partially occupied. So that's the Donbass, Zaporizhia, uh, what's left of Kherson in uh, Crimea. They say that's not for negotiation, that's ours. And of course, Keith says, no, that's Ukraine. So you have a ceasefire with the current uh, you know, line of contact. And what the Ukrainians fear is that Russia will use the ceasefire as time to reload. You know, people, and I, I can go into the details on each of the people that were mentioned that supposedly said uh, Minsk was just meant to buy time. We've got that also in an interview in February from the guy that negotiated on the Russian side. Oh, 15 and I think seconds. If you look at what Merkel said and Olan said and Bennett said, they were describing what happened, not what they planned. Thanks. Over to you, Jill. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to screen share again for a second um, because this keeps coming up. And let me see, where is my screen share? Hang on one second. Okay. So this is the transcript, okay? This is that transcript that keeps coming up uh, of this phone call, this notorious phone call. And uh, starts off, Victoria at Newland says, what do you think? And Piat says, I think we're in play. Um, yada da. The Klitschko piece is complicated because he's been announced as running for deputy prime minister. Um, but I think your argument to him, uh, which you need to make, that's the next phone call you want to set up. It's like the one you did with Yats. I'm glad you put him on the spot and told him where he fits in this scenario. I'm glad uh, what he said in response. In other words, they're manipulating these two guys and they want Yats to go forward and they want to get Klitsch out and they do get him out. And uh, you know, you, you may want to look at this on your own time here, but that's basically what they're saying. They're talking about how they're manipulating these players and to achieve their uh, desired political outcome. Um, and then they go on to say, Yats is the guy, he's got the economic experience, he's a banker, uh, or he's a, he's a finance guy, and they want someone who can work in big finance. You know, this is the U.S. designing what uh, they want out of the Ukraine government. Um, and they go on and talk about how they're manipulating Klitsch is the top dog. He's this very big uh, former boxer, but he's also uh, the mayor of um, of Kiev, and he's a legitimate player. And supposedly he was the most um, uh, charismatic, legitimate player um, on the Maidan, who was not part of the uh, right wing violence. So he was potentially a, a, um, a bulwark against that, but they get him out. You need to reach out to him directly, help help with personality management among the three. We've got to move fast on all this stuff before they sit down and he explains why he doesn't like being outed. They're, you know, this is not um, some innocent discussion about how they're going to be advising Yanukovych. Uh, and then they're talking about how they're bringing in Ban Ki-moon so that uh, he's going to glue this thing. They want to create the impression that this is legitimate and it's inevitable. And then they're getting Biden to come in. So 15 seconds. That the BBC um, uh, has, has that, uh, uh, has the actual transcript. This is not an innocent, uh, you know, commentary of outsiders. These are people who are manipulating the outcome of this violent event that they have basically instigated. Is that, oh, am I on? That, time? That's time. Thanks so much. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. We, we've got three more and looking at the overall time, these are unfortunately going to be our last three questions. Um, we're going to do Linda Mann, followed by Tim Willard, and then Stephen Welzer, and then um, 
Jill and then Howie will have uh, the last three or so minutes to, to wrap up and that will take us out. So um, Linda, go ahead. You have one minute. Hi. I grew up during the Vietnam War and came to support the Vietnamese struggle. I've been involved with struggles uh, or support for struggles by uh, people that are fighting for self-determination, you know, Palestinians, Central Americans. I have never seen any situation where people fighting for an existential fight to save their own lives, to save their children from being consigned to rape camps and infiltration camps, where these people are being second guessed and told that they, they don't have a, a legitimate claim, they didn't have a real revolution. And every I've listened to several of these form, forums and I've debated several people, and it all comes down to Maiden, um, in, in my opinion. Uh, that was the original sin of the um, Ukrainians. They tried to have a revolution because they disagreed about whether or not to join the European Union. And guess who is really against um, Ten seconds. Ukrainians and other, and other uh, former Soviet states joining the European Union is, is, is the Putin. I mean, it's no wonder I keep hearing this, these same charges and counter charges. Well, you know who else is, was against the, the EU? Victoria Nuland. At one point she says, fuck the EU. Um, thanks, thanks so much, Linda. Oh, sorry. And uh, I, I just, just, I just wanna say, have some respect for these uh, people and, and their autonomy and their right to self-determination. Thank you. Uh, Tim, Tim Willard, you're up. Go ahead and unmute. Okay, thank you for letting me ask my question. I have a comment and a question. My comment is that Putin is being supported by every far right wing party in Europe. And, and among other things, Putin is he's constantly talking about restore, preserving traditional Russian values, which among other things means he's anti-feminist. And he is, has in fact outlawed homosexuality in Russia. So how anybody in the Green Party can support Putin is beyond me. Uh, my question is, could you comment on the Russian in invasion of Chechnya and the genocide that was committed there and the Russian invasion of Georgia and the ethnic cleansing that occurred there? And how does this, these previous two invasions inform our understanding of the invasion of Ukraine? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Stephen, you're up. One minute. Go ahead and unmute. Through all of this, Howie and Jill and the commentators, clearly there are so many details in the situation. But you know, there's a distinctive pillar of the Green Party nonviolence. That's that's one of the reasons I joined the Green Party. And and Howie, I mean. I could agree with about everything that you say, <clears throat> except the idea of this imperialist power here sending arms like anywhere. Um, Nonviolence is a very distinctive pillar of the Green Party. And in the beginning, when I joined, and, and so many of us, we had a lot of discussions about how in the world can you be a geopolitical, take geopolitical positions and talk about nonviolence. And we, we, we figured that out. It's like you said, Howie, there's got to be a way to support self-determination. There's got to be a lot of ways, do everything possible, but don't send arms into that situation or, or really the imperialist power of the United States should not send arms anywhere. I'm agreeing for that reason, over. Okay, now we're over to, this is our last wrap it up, uh, answer questions and say whatever you would want to in closing. So first Jill and then Howie. Okay, um, let's see. So wrap up, I guess, um, uh, Steve, uh, you know, you, you speak for me too, you know, that's why I'm agreeing. And I think we need to think outside of the box and people who've been at war with each other um, need a lot of support uh, to number one, get safe, to stop the violence, and then to begin to uh, rehumanize um, their struggle because, you know, people get very dug in 
inside of uh, in the heat of the battle. And it's very hard to emerge from that, you know, short of a, uh, a massive slaughter. But we can't go to that now because we got two nuclear armed powers. So we have to make this transition. You know, this is like an exercise in the modern world. How do we solve conflict? And do we follow conflict to where it's going to take us? Sovereignty is not about supplying weapons. Sovereignty is about creating alternatives uh, outside of weapons that will destroy us all. And what we're talking about here is the role of the US. Are we going to be funding weapons for this struggle? This is not about saying that, um, uh, that Ukraine does or doesn't have a right to strive for sovereignty. It absolutely does, but it, its sovereignty was gone as of 2014 on the Maidan, uh, as of that conversation with uh, Victoria Nuland and Jeffrey Piat. That is not about uh, Ukrainian sovereignty. They've been really manipulated into a corner. They have very few choices. What's happening to them is hor horrific. It's a crime. And uh, David Schwartzman, I am not like uh, taking one side, the opposite of Howie's. I'm saying that we have problems here on both sides. These are both very human players. And we have, you know, we have a uh, struggle and um, you know, terrible decisions and actions happening on all sides. This is what war is. It's never one good guy and one bad guy. And this is where we want to step up to the plate and exercise green values. And, you know, it's not like you get there overnight. It's like, then you have to begin confidence building, but you have to start with a ceasefire. And I agree that, um, you know, calling for throwing uh, gasoline on this very explosive fire that can explode and consume us all is exactly the wrong thing. And I agree with what Janet was saying before, the name of the game here is stepping back, um, everybody taking a deep breath, recognizing that we are all in the um, the crosshairs right now of nuclear weapons. We are all in those crosshairs. And it's, you know, it's it's that kind of a shock, but it's a good kind of shock to uh, understand that uh, all of our lives are imperiled. We don't want to cross that line. We are right up against that line, and we need to stop before we get there, and rethink, and take a deep breath, and then begin to uh, get so get outside of these boxes of one good guy and one bad guy, not from just supporting the battle from the side of the smaller player here, because it's not just two players, it's also the US empire that's been goading Russia into this uh, provoked attack. So it's a complex situation and we have to, I think, uh, summon our highest selves and our highest values. And that's what we're supposed to be about as Greens is getting outside the box and finding another way forward that actually affirms uh, life and sovereignty and democracy uh, and justice. And uh, this is a long haul, but we have to stop by declaring a ceasefire and putting an end to the shipment of weapons. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Howie. Well, to briefly go back to Victoria Nuland and Jeffrey Piat, you read that, and it's in the BBC, uh, you know, news that you know Jill referenced. They're not talking about replacing Yanukovych. They're talking about who they're going to recommend to Yanukovych for the next prime minister. They're doing what the State Department does, what diplomats do. They're trying to influence uh, the people they're working with in other countries. So, and what happened was there finally was a compromise. And when it was proposed on Maidan, the people said, hell no, we're not gonna accept your compromise. We want Yanukovych to go. So the US, you know, they try to compromise. That's what they did with Yanukovych. And, uh, it got rejected by the revolution. As far as nonviolence goes, the Green Platform and our statement about nonviolence in the 10 principles in the preface says we support nonviolence in the sense that we're not going to initiate violence as a political action, but we support the right to self defense. That's what the Green position is right now. I think some people want to change it to a pacifism that would allow violence to go on right in front of you and you do nothing to stop it. Use no force to stop it. And my last point is we should be listening to the Ukrainians on the ground, particularly the people in the progressive movements. You know, the war crimes are real. The bombs are, you know, on their hospitals and schools and homes are real. 
And they're saying, we need arms to defend ourselves. And, you know, if we're worried about the nuclear war, you know, Putin and, and some of the people around him are saying some really crazy stuff. We can't do much about that. I mean, when the Vietnamese were threatened with nukes by Nixon and Kissinger, would we, we didn't know it at the time, but would we have told the Vietnamese, oh, stop, accept the ceasefire, the partition of your country? I don't think we would have, looking back, but now we've got a similar situation in Ukraine. We're worried about nuclear power. We should demand our own government take unilateral nuclear disarmament initiatives, no first use, reduction of the arms down to a minimum credible deterrent, and uh, get rid of the ICBMs, like Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, says we should demand. Those are the kinds of things we should be doing to change our own government policy if we're worried about the threat of nuclear war, which we obviously should be, because Pakistan and India could go at it, and it would be the end of us. You know, we got to really make that, bring that to the top of the agenda. I think if the Ukraine war tells us anything, is we got to get back to the nuclear disarmament agenda that we you know, have pretty much ignored since the end of the 1980s. 15 seconds. I don't need them. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, Justin, Justin, mm -hmm. I was supposed to be reading the chat and getting questions from the chat. And I, it took me a while before I could read it. So I just like to do one for gender balance. It, a few seconds. Uh, it's from, and it's a rhetorical question. It's from Madeline Hoffman, who says, how can someone advocate for deep cuts in a military budget and advocate for billions to be sent to Ukraine? Okay, do you each want to take one minute on that then? Howie, then Jill? Yeah, it's probably directed at me. Uh, mm -hmm. What we're sending to Ukraine is a fraction of our military budget. We can cut the military budget and still send uh, Ukraine what it needs to defend itself. And we shouldn't pit the national liberation, the democratic right to self-determination of Ukrainians against meeting the domestic needs of our own people. There's plenty of resources. If we tax the rich, we cut the military budget. The resources are available to do both, and we should. Jill, any further comment? Um, you know, I'll just repeat that, um, you know, I think Madeline's point is exactly right. Uh, in, of course, we have money that we need, um, and there are many places we could get it, you know, taxing the rich, um, uh, you know, clamping down on corporate crime and tax evasion and, uh, creating our own currency, you know, and, and all sorts of ways that the resources are there, but the reality is that we have, a limited pot in the current mode of creating budgets and you know and and the resources are never provided for healthcare and housing and education and the things that we desperately need um and yet we are throwing over a trillion dollars if you include the uh, VA and the uh, nuclear weapons expenses and if you throw in um, the cost of militarism at home, our militarized domestic society with um, uh, border control and policing and prisons, you know, it's like two thirds actually of our budget. So this budget is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Um, but that said, you know, we should not be pouring our resources into uh, militarism. And, you know, to my mind, the um, $115 billion to Ukraine is, it's not just the money that we don't have, uh, it's money that is, you know, supplying tanks and long range missiles and uh, jet fighters and is the more we boost that military budget, the closer we are uh, to the nuclear brink. And you really cannot uh, fool yourself about that to think we can keep pushing the envelope on military expenditures when we are already uh, at the cliff uh, of nuclear conflagration. So, you know, I think there's some real uh, honest 
uh, appraisal that has to go on here that we cannot do this. Uh, it's absolutely self-destructive to do that. Well, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much to Jill Stein and Harry Hawkins for being here. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, for joining us. It, it feels good to see so many people out there who are feel like this is important and we're here to work together on it and to be able to participate and get into some of the nuanced discussions. Uh, uh, really appreciate that. Um, again, this has been Green Sunday, uh, brought to you by the Green Party of Alameda County in California. Um, you can find us online if you want to connect at acgreens.com. And um, we do this on the second Sunday of every month. So hope to see you again.